dear colleagues, welcome to the third symposium of Prevent from Caries. I want to introduce you our next speaker, Professor Margarita Fontana. She is the Clifford Danson Endowed Professor of Dentistry in the Department of Cariology, Restorative Sciences and Endodontics at the University of Michigan School of Dentistry. She is currently co-director of cariology courses and cariology discipline co-coordinator at the University of Michigan. She was the president of the cariology group of the International Association for Dental Research between 2007 and 8, and the chair of the cariology section of American Dental Education Association between 2010 and 11. As a principal investigator, she has received many research grants associated with cariology and has over 100 papers published in many scientifically valued journals and also she has many prestigious awards. Today, she will present us an update on evidence-based recommendations for non-restorative management of cavitated and non-cavitated lesions. It is my honor to welcome Professor Margarita Fontana. The screen is yours, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully this uh, works. Okay. Um, Okay, so hopefully everyone can see my screen uh, well. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here with uh, everyone today. Um, many colleagues and friends, uh, I wish we could be uh, in person. Uh, welcome and greetings from the University of Michigan. Uh, I'm in the Department of Cariology, Restorative Sciences and Endodontics, and you can see here my email. Uh, I, we will have time for questions at the end, but if by any chance uh, you, we don't get to that and you have questions, please feel free to email me uh, at any time. Uh, my university requires that I disclose to you um, any conflicts of interest. I don't have any personal conflicts of interest. Uh, professionally, I received, uh, you can see here the um, uh, funding agencies that support the research in my clinical and laboratory unit. Um, I'm also a member of the Council on Scientific Affairs of the American Dental Association, which developed the CARES guidelines that I am going to be speaking to you about today. Uh, I also have two large randomized clinical trials ongoing on silver diamine fluoride, and that's one of the strategies that we're gonna be discussing. So I'm not gonna be talking about my own research, but I uh, do need you to know uh, these uh, disclosures. So let's start. Uh, as you know, uh, in, in the last uh, several decades, the, there has been really a strong push to move dentistry towards evidence-based caries management. And while in the 90s, um, a lot of the effort was in um, synthesizing the evidence and looking at systematic reviews and, and meta-analyses. I, I think in the last decade, especially, the emphasis has been in implementation and translation. And what we think about evidence-based, and, and here the chart shows medicine, but dentistry would be the same. Obviously, evidence is one of those important factors, but it's not the only one when we think about implementing evidence in practice, because we have to think about patient-related factors, whether they're cultural or social or economical, and obviously those are going to change in different areas of the world. We have to think about the dentist-related factors regarding their knowledge and experience and, and uh, uh, regarding different products and different techniques. And those also uh, vary around the world. And then we have to think about the healthcare system and the national policies and guidelines and standards and how uh, services are reimbursed and how accessible they are. And those also vary among the world. So even though I'm going to share to you with, with you today some guidelines that were developed by the American Dental Association thinking about the U.S., um, I think some of those things will translate well to your communities and your populations. But there might be some things that don't translate always exactly the same way. And, and I want to make sure that that is clear. Now, uh, many of you know, of course, that this year was the centennial of the International Association for Dental Research. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, uh, of course, the meetings could not be hold, held in person. Um, but uh, as you know, the IADR commissioned a number of papers in different areas of dentistry, kind of reviewing the last 100 years. Um, and I was lucky to be part of a very nice group that was charged with reviewing a century of change in prevention and minimally intervention 
function in cardiology. And I'm showing you a figure from this paper. And, and I think that if you look at the middle of this paper, where we think at the present, where we are, we are really in an era where because of the evidence that we have and our understanding of the disease process, the carries disease process as an ecolog ecological imbalance or dysbiosis, right? Uh, where we know that there we have many effective strategies from fluorides to uh, uh, other strategies to, uh, if we have wonderful new materials, right? Adhesive materials um, always improved uh, that allow us to really deal with the disease process in a very consistent conservative uh, strategy with an emphasis on prevention and minimally invasive uh, treatments. Um, and, and that's where this talk today fits. Now, I'm going to share with you the strategy or what we teach at our university regarding personalized caries management. We know caries, of course, is a disease that can be very chronic, where individuals across the age span can have this disease process, and where strategies to deal with the disease process might vary depending on the age group that we're talking about, depending on the dentition, whether it's primary or permanent, and depending on two surfaces, right, and the severity of the carious lesions. So I, I, I'm taking the simple representation of different stages of the carious disease process to get uh, across the concept that we do have at the tooth level strategies that we know work very well to either uh, prevent carious lesions from developing on sound surfaces, uh, um, arrest uh, and stop and remineralize non-cavitated lesions, uh, uh, address the disease process once lesions cavitate, and even address consequences of periapical infections, right? So for each one of the severities, we have varied alternatives that work. The, the, obviously, although I I am going to be talking specifically at uh, interventions at the tooth level. I do want to remind you that those always need to be accompanied by strategies at the person level, uh, at the individual level, that deal with prevention and management of this disease process. So it's a combination. I am going to be focusing today on one piece of this whole package of disease management that has to do with non-restorative non strategies. But I do want to remind you that those are in the background of uh, prevention and management strategies at the individual level. And that when we're doing these decisions, uh, they have to be based on best evidence. They are normally risk-based and person-centered, so not everyone might receive the same intervention. Uh, they're focused on prevention and remineralization and minimally invasive strategies. So we can be as conservative as possible to advance health and preserve tooth structure and pulpal health. So if you would have asked me to draw this diagram for you maybe uh, 20 years ago, the line between non-restorative and restorative treatment would have been more clearly between the cavitated and non-cavitated lesions. But as you can see, I'm drawing this line now where there's some non-restorative interventions that are also now available and effective to deal with more advanced stages of the disease process like cavitated lesions. And we'll be reviewing those today as well. So I also want to bring this slide because, you know, there, we are all suffering with this global pandemic and there have been so many challenges to our lives, uh, our uh, country, our uh, the, the practice of dentistry um, that have been terrible. But there also, in, in the midst of this crisis, there have been opportunities for change that maybe were not there before. And many of the things that I'm going to be discussing with you today that relate to modern caries management and non-restorative strategies, we have no for a long time, long time that they work, that they improve health outcomes, that they improve patient satisfaction. Many of them involve a reduction of aerosols so it, because many of them can be done actually without producing aerosols. And, and then we can monitor and follow the patient using things like telehealth or so digital ways. So there has been a lot of interest, at least in the United States, I'm not sure about your country, about the uptake of many of the strategies that we're gonna be talking about you today because they're viewed as, um, as an opportunity to implement them. And, but, but what I want, the message that I want to get across is not that this is a good moment if, if you were not implementing some of the strategies to do it, but like this cartoon shows, it's now and beyond. This, is, this are, a lot of the strategies have very good evidence. And even though this is, might be a good moment to start if you hadn't used them before, hopefully those practices will stay even after this pandemic passes. <laughs> 
The other thing that we know is that the amount of information that we nowadays have is, is very large, right? For our students, uh, it's a huge challenge. And even for us in practice, it's a huge challenge to digest all of this information, which is why, um, and we all rely on different sources of information for the most updated information on the different fields of dentistry. But this is difficult. I hope that you all agree with me that it's getting exponentially difficult as we have more access to information, which is why the development of evidence-based guidelines in the United States, at least by the Institute of Medicine, which is one of the highest ranking uh, scientific groups, uh, has been viewed as the way to really move evidence into practice uh, because they synthesize the evidence, produce systematic reviews and meta-analyses, and then through a very very rigorous scientific process that translate the information from those reviews into clinical guidelines that then the clinician can use very easily when a patient is sitting in the chair. Uh, and, and, and so th uh, th that's the philosophy behind it. Uh, the American Dental Association has a plan to develop a very complete and comprehensive caries management guideline. But if you think about what a, a comprehensive caries management would include, it would include detection and diagnosis, it would include risk assessment, it would include prevention, it would include non-restorative management, and it would include restore, restorations. And that includes caries removal uh, and the degree of caries removal and direct and indirect restorations of primary and permanent teeth. So when you think about everything, we're talking about a gigantic amount of information that we need to synthesize and keep updated. So the plan initially was to develop this, break it out in different pieces. We started with this piece about non-restorative treatments, primarily because in the United States a few years back, silver diamine fluoride became available. And rather than doing a separate evidence-based review on silver diamine fluoride, because there's many already in the literature, as you're probably familiar, done by many, many good groups. Uh, and so it didn't feel like it was necessary to do another review on SDF, a systematic review on SDF. Rather, what we decided to do was because sometimes a clinician, if you're faced with through two or three treatment options, you want to know for a particular patient what would be the best alternative for that tooth and that surface and that patient. And then the comparison is not whether uh, fluoride varnish or fluoride gel or prescription fluoride toothpaste or a calcium-based strategy is better. It's actually a ranking of those options based on evidence and based on all the other factors we discussed at the beginning of this talk would be better. And so that's why we started with this guide. I want to tell you that the one on prevention is almost ready. We had a few delays because of COVID-19 work, but this one should be published, I hope, by mid-2021. And the one on restorative treatments, which is very, very large, has just started, and that would probably take us all of next year uh, to complete with an expected publication of 2022. So I'm just giving you uh, the future. So uh, this guideline that what I'm going to be talking to you today, normally the way it's done is that the systematic review and meta-analysis is published in a journal that uh, is of interest to academics. Uh, and this case, it was the Journal of Dental Research. And then the guideline itself is published in a journal that has more access to clinicians. And in this case, this one in particular was published in the Journal of the American Dental Association. And all of the information that I'm going to share with you is available for free. Uh, if you go to the ADA website and look at evidence guidelines, there's guidelines, about two guidelines per year are produced. These are very expensive because there's a lot of work to uh, do the systematic review, the meta-analysis, and then the guideline. Uh, and, and there's different topics, not only topics on cardiology. So this is what the decision tree out of the guideline looks like. This is the one for primary teeth. I'm going to show you the one on permanent teeth. You will notice that um, what we decided to do when looking at this evidence and providing guidelines was to separate the surfaces of the teeth, so occlusal, facial, lingual, and approximal, because not every product is, uh, works or is uh, applicable for every surface. 
And then we decided to also separate the stage of the caries lesion, the severity, because again, not every product works for the same severity of caries lesions. As you can see from the non-restorative perspective, there's a lot of strategies that work for non-cavitated lesions on different surfaces. And for cavitated lesions, uh, the only product available in the United States that works to stop that disease process is 38% uh, silver diamine fluoride. There's other concentrations of SDF around 30% that also work very well. Uh, those are not available in the United States. We know that the lower concentrations like 12% don't work well at all. So when you look at this decision trees, normally products are ranked based on evidence. So you will find sometimes the highest evidence ranked products first. And then the table, for example, will tell you if this is not feasible, then it provides other options. And normally, again, these are ranked based on evidence, but also cost accessibility. Um, uh, ease of treatment, etc. We'll be discussing some of those in a minute. I wanted to show you the one on permanent teeth as well. We will be discussing these treatments in a minute. Uh, the only difference with the one on primary teeth, you have the coronal surfaces similarly, but then you have obviously the one for root surfaces when we talk about permanent teeth. Uh, and, and in this case, we combine non-cavitated and cavitated lesions because many times these clinical trials don't separate these two very well. So uh, it's difficult to make recommendations and separate them. And so you see the decision tree here and we'll be talking about that in a minute. The other thing that I want to emphasize to you when you look at any clinical practice guideline done by this group or any other group, normally there will be the recommendations. And these are worded the same things that you saw in the decision tree. And you don't need to read the small letters. We will be talking about this. What I want you to see is the colors the certainty of the evidence and the strength of the recommendation. And what I want, the, I guess the message here is that um, uh, pro, uh, studies or products or strategies or recommendations for which we have either a lot of evidence or the evidence is all very uh, in the same direction. There's uh, little variation. Uh, there's a lot of consistency. Is applicable exactly to the tooth or type of carious lesion that you are interested in treating, uh, then that evidence is going to be stronger. And you will see it here highlighting green. Uh, the ones where we have less evidence or the evidence is more contradictory, so one study says one thing, the other study says another thing, or maybe we have evidence for primary teeth, but we want to use it on permanent teeth, and so it's indirect right? We are, we're using information from one type of dentition into the other dentition indirectly. That will affect the strength of the recommendation. And, rec and, and where we have good evidence, the recommendations are going to be very strong, which means that if you encounter this, we expect that if you use this and follow this recommendation, you should probably see the same effect in your patient. When you see the evidence is less clear, you will see that the recommendation, there's still a recommendation, but it's more conditional because it means that, that we, we are less certain and we need stronger evidence to make sure that if you would apply this same recommendation to your patients, you would find the same result. The other thing that I want to mention is that most recommendations will have recommendations in favor of a treatment, a sealants or fluoride varnish or prescription toothpaste. But sometimes there's recommendations against a treatment. In this case, in this guideline, the only recommendation against the treatment was a recommendation against calcium-based products when there was a, a available fluoride intervention, sealants, or resin infiltration. Because the evidence on those other interventions was so much stronger uh, and the evidence on the calcium-based products was so much lower and contradictory that the, the panel that, uh, that following this process to create these recommendations viewed that there was uh, no clear rationale to prefer that uh, calcium-based strategy over some of these other interventions. But notice that this is a conditional recommendation, again, because the number of studies uh, and the quality of those studies are um, uh, could be improved. So let's start with some of these treatment options, right? So let's talk about sealants. Sealants is the easier one. I am not talking about sealants for prevention. I hope we all agree that for prevention on sound surfaces, sealant is a really good strategy to prevent that surface. I am talking about once you have like the example here, and this is obviously an extracted tooth, a non-cavitated lesion, right? A white spot lesion here in the fissure system. And I've cut the tooth in half for you to see. Uh, this is a would be an ICDAS-2 lesion 
lesions. For those of you who uh, follow the ICDAS criteria, this is a non-cavitated lesion. Um, it's a lesion that histologically, you see this already demineralizing not only the enamel, but the dentin tissues. Um, and so we're talking about uh, treatment for those type of lesions. So um, as you can see, the evidence is pretty good and the recommendation is pretty strong that uh, whether it's on primary or in permanent teeth, uh, using a uh, sealing this non-cavitated lesions, whether the sealant is alone or whether you put the sealant and then follow that with a fluoride varnish application in the mouth, both show very, very good uh, results in arresting those lesions. And we, of course, are building on existing and previous systematic reviews that we had done. We did this one in 2008 by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where we reviewed the evidence about a, a, a decade uh, earlier than this recommendations that I'm showing you here. And, and, the, and the recommendation was that this sealants work very well to arrest the non-cavitated lesions with a preventive fraction of about 71%, which is very similar to the preventive fraction that you see with sealants on sound surfaces. And, and there was also a systematic review done by the CDC published at the same time in 2008, showing that most bacteria uh, are uh, not survived under a sealant. There's a very small amount that do survive, but they don't are not probably clinically relevant. Uh, and most uh, bacteria will not survive in those very uh, harsh environments. So if you look at this graph, you will see that sealants, and this is true for both primary and permanent teeth, is the treatment of choice. The evidence for sealants alone or followed by a fluoride varnish is significantly stronger than that for other alternatives. But the other alternatives also work very well. Uh, you will notice, interestingly, also that sealants are listed here at the bottom of the option for interproximal lesions. Uh, and you will notice that there's a, an alternative material uh, that is resin infiltration that is also listed as an alternative for interproximal lesions. So let me tell you a few things about that. Uh, for those who might think that sealing carries lesions is new, I want to remind you that the first review that was ever done on this topic that was done in 1983 found that the evidence was, I, I love this wording, overwhelming, that the vitality of the pulp was not affected and that this carries lesions could in fact become inactive. So this is 1983, which was uh, a little bit over a decade after sealants had become available in practice. So we have consistently uh, looked at this literature and concluded the same thing. When you think about which way would be the material of choice, um, the decision is a little bit more complicated, particularly if you throw away all the studies with materials that are currently not available. So for example, all the old studies with ultraviolet polymerized sealants. Well, we don't have those materials anymore. So if you only focus on a review of materials, uh, uh, whether they're glass ionomer or uh, resin composites or, or the in-betweens, right? Um, uh, then obviously there's less study and it's much more difficult to conclude whether one material is superior to the other. So the recommendation in this guidelines is that the material of choice should be based on, on on an alternative um, factor, which is retention. So for example, in this tooth that you see here on the slide, if isolation is difficult, then obviously you're not gonna be able to use a material that depends very strongly in functioning on retention uh, on a dry surface, like a resin composite. And therefore the material of choice would be a glass ionomer material. On the other hand, if you can isolate and ensure that the area is kept dry and, uh, and you are uh, trying to uh, uh, obtain long-term retention, then a material like a resin composite or resin-based material might be preferable. So the, again, in either case, both materials work well. Um, and the decision to use one versus the other is going to require monitoring over time. And just knowing that a glass ionomer material because of wear, you're probably going to be replacing more frequently. Can we seal then more moderate lesions? This would be uh, in the ICDAS language, ICDAS three or four lesions, the ones where we have a micro cavitation or where we have a small uh, shadow. So the, there's a few studies in the literature. This is one that we did and published back in 2014. We sealed sound in uh, uh, ICDAS one, two, three, and four. So non-cavitated and micro cavitated lesions, initial small cavitations. And what we found is that sealants were very effective in all those lesions and the retention was very good. But 
there has been a really nice study done in the northern part of Europe where they did a randomized clinical trial comparing sealants to very conservative restorations. And what they found there without repair, in, in, the, in, the, in, our, in my study, uh, in our study, um, we did repairs annually. Uh, so what this group found was that uh, the success for restorations, very conservative restorations, was very, very good. But for sealants, if you, uh, I apologize, uh, for sealants, if you did not repair them, the survival after seven years was only 37%, which really means that uh, you could re uh, seal these materials, but uh, these lesions, but the materials that we have right now are probably going to require a lot of repair over time if you do that which is why and currently is not recommended unless you have the ability to really monitor that surface very carefully. And, and to me, that is a research question. Now, if I put my researcher hat on, that means that if we could improve those materials, right, we could improve uh, the survival of those lesions being uh, sealed. Because what the data shows that if they're sealed, the lesions will arrest. Um, we also have uh, data on sealants on interproximal lesions. And so this is a systematic review that was published now a few years back. And you will notice that at the time of the systematic review, they included uh, their, uh, here the, the first part of this forest plot, they're comparing resin-based sealants versus a control. And the control is normally flossing in this interproximal lesions. And in the second part, they're comparing resin infiltration versus a control. And you can sh show in this forest plot that both interventions work well. There was another arm where they looked at glass ionomer sealants. And for this interproximal lesions, the glass ionomer sealants don't work well because they wear off. Now, uh, the resin sealant, uh, the problem is the technique, right? That um, in most cases, this requires uh, separation of the tooth. Uh, and, and normally that is done with an um, ortho Dontic rubber band and you need to separate the tooth for a couple of days and the patient needs to come back. So it becomes a very uh, complicated and labor intensive process, which might be difficult to implement in some parts of the world but it works well. So an alternative was developed so that the patient wouldn't need to come back on a separate time. And this uh, infiltration materials were developed. Uh, the um, commercial name in the United States is ICON. Uh, the delivery method is really brilliant because there's this matrix that goes in between the teeth and has uh, um, holes on the side that you want to treat while it's protecting the neighboring tooth. And then you're gonna do the same steps as a sealant. You're gonna etch, you're gonna dry, you're going to uh, then change your syringe to use your uh, infiltration material. And then a sealant, the material sits on the surface. Well, for the infiltration, the material, we're, we're using a stronger acid to etch the surface. And the material is permeating or infiltrating inside of the lesion. And when you look at the systematic reviews, the clinical trials, this one is from Colombia, for example, where I'm showing you three years data. This is a control, the 70% of the lesions progress. While in both the infiltration and the sealant group, uh, the uh, treatments reduce caries progression by half or more than half. So these uh, strategies have been shown consistently to be effective. Some people uh, are also using them for aesthetic purposes. Um, uh, for, for example, this, are, this is a publication where they're using it uh, to, this is post-orthodontics. Hopefully you would have prevented this to begin with, right? But, but here you have the uh, uh, white spot lesions uh, and, and uh, he, here's after infiltration. In some cases you see an improvement, in other cases you don't. And here you see them treating also uh, either fluorotic lesions or hypoplastic lesions. And again, in some cases it works, in other cases it doesn't work, but it's a very conservative strategy and if that doesn't and work, you can always go with a more uh, uh, aggressive strategy for, for aesthetic purposes. Now, the question really is, can we stop the caries process when we have lesions that are more advanced or severe, like cavitated lesions? I think that if we see the pictures that I'm showing you here on the screen, uh, the top one is uh, obviously an adult patient. Uh, this was an 18 year old. This is a young child in one of our clinical trials. This nice pictures is from a cariology textbook by Dr. Bentanivet. You can see clearly the examples uh, that uh, this type of lesions 
are difficult to arrest, right? You see here plaque and food accumulating. Many of these lesions are sensitive. These patients were not brushing very well or using adequate fluorides to begin with, which is why they got to this stage. So I think we would all agree that it's difficult, but we certainly have examples in the literature and clinical examples that if self-cleansing is possible, then, and, and you certainly provide fluoride in the environment, that these lesions can arrest. And you see examples here, this is a child, uh, obviously, this is a primary dentition, mixed dentition, and, and you see this very broad and open, carious lesions. These are black, just there's no silver diamine fluoride here. This is just by brushing and using a fluoride toothpaste, and, and, and these lesions are hard to the touch now. Uh, and here in this example from Dr. Neva, you see an example of a root carious lesion, again, very accessible. This is just by regular cleaning with fluoride, and you see the lesion, again, uh, the, if you could feel it, it would be the dentin was from being very soft and sticky is becoming harder and you can see part of the discoloration. So this is possible, but I think we would all agree that it's sometimes difficult to achieve, particularly in this higher risk patients. We certainly have examples in the literature that include strategies, including uh, that I am not going to be talking to you today because of time, like hall crowns uh, or um, the. Um, uh, so this is an example from Dr. Nicholas in his paper uh, on the hall crown, where uh, you uh, remove the food and debris from inside the hole, and that basically without the need for anesthetics, you are going to seal these carious lesions in a way with a stainless steel crown, right? And then you have other strategies that have been described in the literature. In this case, they're called non-restorative strategies, but I don't want you to get confused with all the other non-restorative strategies that we're talking about today, in which you're making the lesion self-cleansable. So you're opening up the lesion to facilitate the self-cleansing that I discussed previously. And again, in randomized clinical trials where these techniques have been compared, and this one, for example, that I'm showing you is a very nice one uh, done in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and, and you can see here the three comparisons. This is a survival curve. Uh, this uh, line almost flat here on the top is the whole crown showing a very, very good survival after 40 months. And, and uh, here's a typical survival curve. This is for restorative treatment in, in orange. And, and the green one is for the normal restorative treatment of strategy. And again, this is in primary teeth. Uh, so uh, there's certainly other ways to manage these lesions than the strategies that we're talking about. But I think we would all agree that managing this cavitated lesions, not restoratively, for many high-risk patients that are not brushing well and are not brushing frequently uh, or have other conditions that might difficult treatment, is very difficult. And that's why some uh, products have been developed as alternatives to restorative intervention. And the one that I want to mention to you is silver diamine fluoride. Uh, and, and this is part of a, a silver fluoride family of products that have been developed over uh, many decades, different types of formulations, et cetera. This one has fluoride, uh, ammonia, and silver at a 38% concentration. And uh, of course, all of these products with high concentration fluoride, like any high fluoride concentration product will occlude dentinal tubules. Here you have dentinal tubules open. This is from Dr. May's uh, publication. And you can see the tubules blocked, which of course will then explain why these products work very well to decrease sensitivity um, and vital teeth. Uh, these products are not an alternative for a tooth that has irreversible pulpitis. It will not save you from a root canal or a pulpotomy. Uh, this is, a, a, but it will decrease sensitivity associated with carious lesions as long as you have vital uh, pulp. Uh, and as you can see here, examples of different teeth treated in our clinics and patients uh, with uh, a, a range of cavitated lesions. So if you look at products available, in this case, this is a list of products available in the United States. Uh, uh, different countries might have additional types of fluoride. For example, we don't have a mean fluoride in the US. Uh, in many other countries, you have a mean fluoride as well. And you might even have different concentrations. So we don't have, for example, concentrations of uh, uh, lower concentrations of fluoride toothpaste over the counter. Uh, in other countries, there are very con different concentrations. But these are products that we have in mouth rinses and toothpaste uh, for use at home. And these are the examples of products that we use uh, for professional use. 
And as you can see, there's no doubt that uh, silver diamine fluoride, the 38% concentration, is one of the highest fluoride concentration products that we have uh, for professional application. Uh, the difference is that many of these other products are really intended for caries prevention uh, or for arrest of non-cavitated lesions, as you saw in the uh, decision tree table that I showed you before, and I'm going to show you again. While SDF was really intended as a treatment treatment, specifically at the tooth level, for lesions that are more advanced and are cavitated. So the intended uh, target tooth is a little bit different. These are the two products we have in the United States and other countries. You certainly have other types, uh, other, other uh, commercial product names. Uh, in general, this come either in a multi-bottle use or for unidose, which obviously makes it a little bit more expensive. Um, I do want to differentiate something between uh, this product and, and a varnish. Uh, so this product, uh, the same as fluoride gels, professional fluoride gels and foams, uh, has fluoride available uh, very easily that gets uh, uh, that is that is available to react with dental with the, uh, tissues, tooth structure tissues, right after application. This is a little bit different than fluoride varnishes, where the, the fluoride is carried in, in, a, in a carrier that varies depending on the product that you have uh, available. In the United States, we have many different fluoride varnishes types. Uh, and, and it's going to release that fluoride uh, slowly over a period of time. So it is really important that the varnish remain in contact with the tooth structure for a long period of time. Uh, because that reaction, that release of fluoride, and the and the reaction of that fluoride with the two structure will take some time. So it's a little bit different. So let's go back to the decision tree. So as you can see in the case of coronal surfaces, the all in this in this evidence-based practice guideline, the only treatment alternative that we found to be effective on cavitated lesions was the SDF solution on coronal surfaces. Uh, and this was both for primary and permanent teeth. I'm showing you the one for permanent teeth here for um, ease of uh, for for speed. Uh, but if I would show you the one for primary teeth, uh, you would see that is identical. Now, interestingly, you will notice that for root surface caries, uh, we have other treatment options that work really well. So SDF certainly is an option, uh, but there are other options that will work well to arrest uh, root surface lesions, and not only uh, uh, SDF. Okay, and I'm showing you here, for example, fluoride varnish as an example of a particular professional fluoride product that you will see that is effective to arrest non-cavitated lesions on every one of these surfaces. Uh, and, and the nice thing about a varnish as well is that will also help with prevention, right? So you have here a product that can uh, really work in a variety of different uh, um, conditions, uh, and not only for prevention, but for uh, caries lesion management except for cavitated lesions, right? Okay, so I am not gonna get too much into the chemistry because people tend to get bored with the chemistry, but I do want to, and, and, and you know, there's been debate about the exactness of some of these formulas that have been published in the literature, et cetera. But I do want to tell you that in general, every professional fluoride product that, that you have, whether it's a gel, a foam, a varnish, or SDF, because of the very high concentration of fluoride tends to form this calcium fluoride deposits that will release fluoride over time. And that's how these products can have this effect for a long period of time. This is different, as you know, of course, how toothpaste and mouth rinses work, where this product, mouth rinses and toothpaste for home use, require that you use them frequently every day to be able to do what they're supposed to do. These professional fluoride products we use every three or every six months or sometimes every year. And so they have to have, they do have a different mechanism of action. So SDF has a lot of fluoride. So we'll produce a lot of calcium fluoride and do a lot of the wonderful things that all professional fluoride products do very well. The other thing that SDF has is because of the silver, uh, the silver will precipitate, will react with the tooth structure. And as you know, silver is a very potent antimicrobial. So the moment you paint, in this case, I'm showing you here some cervical lesions, right? Uh, this is obviously a patient, an adult patient with permanent teeth. 
Uh, this is a month after treatment, um, and and the product will be painted here, and uh, and uh, there will be a reaction with the two structure, and and the moment you place it, there's going to be a strong antimicrobial effect, meaning that most of the bacteria in that area are not going to survive, but uh, and and then it's also going to inhibit a, a lot of the collagenase enzymes that are affect that are involved in in degrading dentin in the caries process. So you have the combination of the fluoride and all of this other effects from the silver product that are really going to accelerate the hardening uh, the the hardening of this tooth surface which with other products might take a longer period of time here you sometimes you see this hardening effect much faster the other thing is because of the silver you have the black color of course but i'm showing you this picture on purpose we published this in dental and re caries research uh, last year and there have been since two other publications in children uh, that have shown uh, something similar clinically, where I, I hope you can see plaque growing on top of this lesion that was treated with SDF. Uh, and I think the message here is that although you have a very strong antimicrobial effect immediately after application, that tooth is not releasing silver over time. So if you don't teach that patient to keep that area clean and good plaque control, good diet control, all the other things that we would normally teach this patient who is obviously a high risk patient and needs a lot of different strategies for the disease process itself, um, this is going to affect the ability of this product to function. If you look at the um, uh, uh, clinical guideline that I just showed with you, you will notice that the uh, recommendation for using SDF on primary teeth is very strong because the majority of the studies that have been done have been done with children. Obviously, children are a perfect target for this product because uh, either of uh, age or behavioral issues, et cetera. Uh, the, this is a very easy strategy that does not require anesthetic. And so it, it's, it's a very... Uh, patient-friendly strategy, particularly for young children. So many studies have been done with primary teeth. So uh, for permanent teeth, except for uh, studies that have been done on root caries, that uh, there have been obviously studies on permanent teeth. It's just compared to primary teeth, there have been many less studies. And therefore, uh, you know, we some of this information we're extrapolating uh, to assume the caries process is similar, except that tissues are, of course, thicker <laughs> and, and permanent teeth compared to primary teeth, but that we expect that it's going to work similarly. And and that's why you see this recommendation being a little bit more conditional. Depending on who you read, right, there's many systematic reviews on this topic. One application of SDF will result between 60 to 80 percent of uh, uh, caries arrest. It's not 100 percent. Nothing is 100 percent, but uh, a significant number of lesions will arrest. We know that uh, lesions tend to, uh, uh, this number tends to increase with repeated number of applications over time. And we also know that there's something that I'm calling the oral hygiene effect that has been described in many of these trials very well, where the lesions where this doesn't seem to work very well are the lesions where uh, the area does not, is not kept clean. Uh, the areas with a lot of visible plaque, the areas, a lot of the posterior areas that are more difficult to self clean those are many times the ones where this product tends not to work as well. The areas where the lesion is more, for example, anterior, easy to self-cleanse, easy to have access to good oral hygiene and, and access to uh, fluoridated toothpaste, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and, and et cetera, that tend to be areas where this product tends to work very well. I am not going to show you this video, but if you do a, a, a YouTube search for SDF and ADA and evidence based, you will find a five short, a five minute short video produced based on how clinical trials are, have been done with this product on what the correct application. But patients need to be have an informed consent. The lesions will turn very dark, and so they need to be informed, especially if there's an aesthetic uh, location. You need to remove the plaque because you want to paint it on the tooth, not on the food or the plaque. Uh, and then you want to dry the lesion because you don't want to dilute the product. We know that lower concentrations are not effective. So we want to make sure that we're not diluting the product. And then what you're going to deep the microbrush and make sure that you're painting the whole lesion uh, and then uh, remove any excess, particularly if this is a very young child, a very thin and young child, because you want to uh, avoid unnecessary ingestion. And these are high-risk patients 
solutions to everything else that you would do for this patient at home in an office regarding good oral hygiene, good diet control, uh, fluoride uh, access, et cetera, you still have to do. And then you need to reapply this product. Uh, the uh, evidence systematic review that we did uh, suggested a six month application if possible, if not at least annually. Of course, if you see the patient before the six months, uh, please feel the lesion. And if it's not hard, consider reapplying that or doing something else. I want to end very quickly with a couple of questions. Uh, the uh, question about a, a, an indirect halo effect and for prevention. I think uh, this is an umbrella systematic review that was published earlier this year, uh, or maybe it was at the end of last year, I apologize, uh, uh, 2019, uh, concluded that really the quality of the evidence was still very low to be able to answer this question with a lot of certainty. Certainly what you should not do is apply it to every surface for prevention. This is not a, direct preventive agent. Um, now, a lot of people restore this teeth afterwards because, of course, you have a, a hole in the tooth and you want to make it, that makes the tooth more fragile uh, and, uh, and you have a risk of surfaces breaking up over time and having other types of functional problems, et cetera. So there's no doubt that if you could restore this teeth in a very uh, patient-friendly manner, that that would be the preferable uh, strategy to use. Uh, I think SDF is a wonderful strategy for when uh, this is not possible. And then the question is obviously, well, if I then come back and want to restore this tooth, would there be an issue with the adhesion of whether it's a glass ionomer or resin composite, etc. This uh, is a nice systematic review that was recently published by the group in Hong Kong that who has done the majority of this work uh, on this product that this was published in 2020 showing you that there's really a lot of disparity in mostly laboratory data regarding the um, effects uh, of, uh, of binding of different materials to SDF. Uh, on primary teeth where the life expectancy of the tooth is short in the mouth, it's probably not a big problem. But for permanent teeth, just be aware that we don't have a lot of longitudinal data. How about interproximally flossing it in? Is it better than fluoride? Well, we know a lot of these lesions that are in enamel or radiographically in the outer parts of denting are non-cavitated. We do know that for non-cavitated lesions, there's many options that are really good to arrest these lesions, especially options with fluoride, uh, the same as infiltration, et cetera. And we know that if we could treat those lesions more conservatively, that would be advisable. Uh, so, but we really don't have good randomized clinical trials to answer this question. If you ask my opinion for whatever it's worth, I think that if you could get enough fluoride there and out of this product there, potentially it could work because of the fluoride. I don't know if the silver adds anything to it, but uh, it, it should work if you get enough fluoride and you have a non-cavitated lesion, but we really need randomized clinical trials well designed to answer this question. And last Lastly, I end with this. This was recently published uh, looking at children one to three. And what you will see is the arrest rate is much lower than the ones that I was mentioning to you, 20% at six months and only 35% at, at 12 months. And, and the discussion in this paper was that for patients where the technique might be more complicated and more difficult, where you can't isolate very well or dry very well, you might expect to see lower uh, results uh, compared to other conditions where the technique can be more careful. So the technique matters. So in conclusion, caries management includes prevention at the individual level and two targeted strategies at the surface level. We have best evidence practice guidelines and when those exist, they should be implemented into practice. The strategies vary by tooth type and by surface. Not everything works exactly the same well. And there's no doubt that these lesions need to be monitored over time. We do know that SDF restorative treatment is your uh, treatment of choice for cavitated lesions, but if you can, and you should always try to preserve tooth structure and pulpal health and reducing discomfort and pain. But SDF is a great alternative, whether interim or whether permanently, if you can do a restoration on a tooth, but it, and, and it's not 100%. Uh, and we certainly need more help implementing that. So with that, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be here with you. And I am very happy to answer questions. So I think I'm going to end my slideshow and, um, and, and, and go back to, um, to answering any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your amazing and informative presentation. Uh, there is a question for you. 
Um, what should be the major factor in determining personalized prevention method? Um, Dr. Zeynep Ceren Çelik asked. Yeah, so that is an excellent question. You know, I didn't discuss prevention in this talk. I was really talking about non-restorative treatment options. But regardless of the treatment option that you want, that you are uh, electing for a particular patient, I think the age of the patient is very important, the uh, likelihood that the patients would adhere and that recommendations are uh, acceptable uh, for the individual. This is a, an informed consent process where options are discussed. Uh, and and, uh, and, uh, and and an option that fits a particular patient uh, is try that has high levels of evidence, right? Is tried to be uh, reached. Um, as you see in, in this case, and for prevention, it's the same way. Obviously, not every product has access equally to every surface of every tooth, and certainly not every product has been tested equally in different types of dentitions. Uh, and so, um, the the quality of the evidence is going to sometimes vary for particular products in one dentition and another. I think there's no doubt that for fluoride and sealants, fluoride products in general, whether they're at home or professional, and sealants, those are two of the strategies that without a doubt have some of the strongest evidence for prevention as they have it in this case for non-restorative treatment options. But which one would you use? Uh, it it's probably has a lot to do with the risk of the patient, uh, the age of the patient, and, and the likelihood of adhering to recommendations. Um, and, and that's why it, it, there, there's a personalized element here where not everything necessarily is a cookie cutter approach where we do the same thing always for the for everyone. Thank you, Professor. Uh, and I have a question. Uh, when we uh, use SPF uh, in the uh, deep carries lesion, if you use it uh, to prevent or arrest the caries uh, under the restoration, um, does the effect of the SPF decrease it when we use it under the restoration? That is an excellent question. <laughs> And I wish I had a good answer for you. I, I can tell you uh, uh, that we know that if you can restore and seal well a cavitated lesion, even if you do a selective caries removal and you leave, or, or even no caries removal and leave some caries behind, we know that if you can seal it well, and I think the hull crown is an example of that, and certainly small ARTs are example of that where the restoration stays in place well, we know that those lesions arrest, that even if you don't remove all the carious tissue and you leave some active soft uh, uh, tissues behind, carious tissues behind, as long as the restoration is intact and can seal it off, that those tissues are gonna rest without SDF, right? So we know that. Uh, now, in those ideal conditions, would SDF add anything to those strategies? I don't know. We really need randomized clinical trials to answer that question. Now, there's also the cases where sometimes we're doing, especially on, on primary teeth, on young children, sometimes we do some of this ART that are larger. <laughs> maybe they're two surface. Uh, maybe sometimes they're bigger. We do know that... Um, the effectiveness of some of these uh, restorations will decrease the larger they are. Uh, and, and But sometimes we don't have other options, right? So we're trying to work with the best. Uh, and so I know colleagues that use SDF under those conditions because they want to have some safeguard in case the restoration is not perfect. So it certainly makes sense, right? It, it makes perfect sense. But there, I, I just want you to be aware that there are no well-conducted uh, randomized clinical trials trials to really answer this question. So um, potentially, yes, uh, particularly for those cases where you might think that the restoration is not as perfect as we would want, uh, you, you would think that potentially, yes. But I don't have trials that I can give you to answer that question. On the other hand, if the restorations are really well placed, like a hull crown or a one surface ART that we know works well to arrest those tissues, is there an advantage to SDF? I really don't know. Uh, you would need probably a very large trial to answer that question because the uh, uh, control treatments are very effective. <laughs>
So if you want to show a difference, you're going to need a very large sample size to show that difference. But there could be the, the other differences regarding patient acceptability. You know, there's other measures, not only the caries arrest itself, the disease itself, that we need to take into account. Um, secondary caries in the future. Uh, but again, those trials need to happen, need to be done. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't do it. We just need to be aware that we're doing it right now uh, without a lot of good evidence. And, uh, and so we, ju we just have to be aware that as evidence becomes available, uh, we might need to change a little bit what we're doing. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Um, it was an amazing presentation and thank you for your time. Uh, well, I want to thank everyone. Thank you for the invitation. And it was a pleasure to be here with everyone, all my friends and, uh, and colleagues uh, from Turkey. And um, uh, have a good evening. And thank you very much again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.